This is a, another video on converting JSON data to X12 data. Specifically, uh, we're talking about an 837 situation where you have JSON data and it's going into an 837 format. On this video, it's a little bit different because I'm going to cover some actual programming code as well as mapping documents, you know, so that you'll have everything for your development team or if you're just starting out, you can see a, a, an overview of how this works. Conceptually, what we're doing here is we're starting out with a JSON file and then we're creating an extract file from that that will actually hold the extracts that you have taken from your JSON file, but it will also or could also hold things like the loop uh, ID, you know, 1000A, 2300, stuff like that, and the segment name and the element number, like it is at the fifth element, for example. So you can see that that's the process. You're not going from the JSON file uh, straight to the 837. You're going from JSON to this extract file, from the extract file, then to the actual 837 file. In, in this example, we're using 837. The reason why I'm promoting this or suggesting this is that when you build a file in between, it allows more room for adding edits or error reports, and it just becomes more professional that way. Um, with these type of conversion processes where you're converting from JSON into an X12, uh, it's really helpful if you have some unique tags. Unfortunately, most of the projects that I've seen, I've seen several, uh, they're not using unique tags. Uh, I've said this before, I'll say it again. I encourage the use of loop ID and qualifiers included in each JSON tag. Uh, if you were to use those, it would make this process so much easier. But if you don't, then you're going to need this or this conversion process, okay? Um, when you do an extract, you can extract to an array or to a data file. That's your choice. Um, either way you go, I would encourage uh, opening up your file in binary mode so you can deal with the bits and bytes a little bit easier. Um, one other programmatic uh, point that I want to make here is that you need to be able to define uh, what the end of the transaction looks like. Now, for each of the JSON files, they might have something that looks like, for example, uh, SE trailer, for example, you know, or it might say something different. You know, I don't know. It depends on who wrote the, the JSON code, but this could vary. OK, and you also need to know or define uh, what the end of the file looks like. You know, it, it might see, say IEA, you know, for example, that's the end of it of a transaction in A37, okay? Um, so that's basically an overview of this middle file. Uh, there's a lot of details that we can go into, but this will get you into an understanding of how these processes work. Uh, for this example, also I'm going to include just a generic uh, JSON file with some generic data in here. Uh, you can see here that if you were to, to go, do a conversion on this JSON file, you need to know where things are located, and that's where uh, we come into this JSON to X12 A37 map example. I've included, for example, the JSON tag name, um, also an example or the contents of the JSON data itself, and then the array name, or I'm sorry, the, the array loop name, uh, segment name, element number, and, and uh, the composite number, for example. So if I were to look at, for example, this JSON code that says billing provider, billing provider last, I go down here to the map and I see billing provider last, the data is Baker, and then the loop assigned to it is 2010AA, it's the NM1 segment, it's the third element over, and it is required. So if I was developing this, I would have a map of the 837 and I would start building the ISA and GS and ST and start walking through there. And then when I came to the 2010 AA loop, you know, I would look at the data file or array, depending on how you program this. And then I would extract the data from the file or from the array according to this map. Um, so this will give you a good idea. The required or situational or dependent information right here. 
This column is not required, uh, but it's very, very polite and, and helpful for the developer. So I, I would encourage using something like that. Let's take a look now at some actual code. You know, if you're wondering where to begin, this will get your wheels turning, okay? So if I was to write this program, for example, I would say, for example, dimension and array that's you know, 5,000 lines long by 250. Um, in this example, the 5,000 represents how many lines are in one 837 transaction. You know, typically that's probably between 40 and 80 lines. So 1,000 would have been too much, but I use 5,000. And 250 would be how many segments, uh, you know, you might uh, actually, that would be like how many elements that you could find within, you know, a segment, for example. And, and you can, again, you can program this different ways, you know, where there's, you know, lines and segments or, you know, elements. There are different ways you could program this. This is just to give you an example. If I use an array, I want to make sure that I'm covering at least how many segments that we've got. So, you know, uh, in this example, a segment might be 250 characters long, and I can cut that up into other elements, or I could use another style for programming it. The point is that you need to have a file, you know, a comma separated, or an array, you know, where you're defining the contents of this middle file. This is the in-between process. Okay, so define your pointer, and then also as you go down here, you can see that I'm starting my looping logic. So after you've made your variable declarations, you've opened your file probably in binary mode, start defining your loops. If sender ID, remember that's our JSON tag. Uh, if you find that, define the loop ID as header. If you see a tag that says billing provider, and the middle the loop ID starts with two three or maybe two four, then you want to define this loop ID to twenty ten AA. Okay, and then you can see in this example what I've done here is I've actually uh, started assigning you know, the loop ID, the segment name, and then uh, I've called it an extraction process that would actually pull the data or you know push the data, or however you want to do that. Okay. Depending on how you program it, this will give you an, uh, an idea that at this point you're starting to assign variable uh, variable definitions to your loop ID counter. When you get to this section here, it's simply checking for the end of the claim or the end of the file. This is a trigger. When you find that, then you need to call your function to actually write it. Now this is high level, so it kind of gives you an idea of programmatically what to do. Uh, but just know that there are a lot of different details that you'll run into when you actually start programming it, uh, your actual conversion. But I think this will help you understand, you know, an idea of how to start, you know, your process. Uh, in conclusion, I, I do want to make two important points here. The heavy lift or the hard work is in two areas. Number one, this map. That's a tremendous a lot of work, uh, work to do. Um, you know, some some situations will require a JSON to 837 conversion, and there's no easy way around this. This is a lot of work. There's a lot of data there, and uh, it's going to take a while to define all these. And if you start cutting corners, you're talking about live data, you're really going to run into some problems. It's best to have a map like this so that everything is documented. The other difficult point is actually in defining these names. If you have JSON code that says last name or address, you know, you're you're in for some programming, basically, you know. Um, that's why I encourage, like if I were to write, for example, last name, it would have said 2010 AA underscore 85 underscore last name, for example. And then there's absolutely no doubt about where it goes. And if you ever have a situation where you have to do some sort of backward conversion, like usually it goes from 837 to JSON, but there are real life situations where folks want to go from JSON to 837. So if you ever have that situation, 
you have absolutely no problem whatsoever performing this conversion. That's what this video is all about because I'm running into situations where folks are having difficulty because they didn't develop their JSON code uh, to a way that was, you know, backwards compatible if you had to go from JSON to 837. And now they're going to have to write a program of some kind because they don't want to change, you know, their JSON structure because they spent millions of dollars implementing it. So just know that if you cut that corner, then you're going to have to frame up some hours to do that. Uh, you know, it, it, this is really just like creating an, another process. You know, you're you're developing a whole conversion, basically, you know. And, and that's, you know, that's the bad news. But, um, you know, uh, this all could have been avoided if, if there were some unique tag names. But... Um, I always, they get to me after this was already done. So anyway, I hope this helps out. I think that by having this information, it might uh, make this process move along a little bit quicker. You know, I would encourage the use of, uh, make sure that you've got some implementation guides that, that list out every one of your segments and elements and loops and make sure they're correct. I run into some examples where people start developing things and they use, if I, I got a hold of them and they were using a 4010, you know, implementation guide that someone had just stuck a label on there that said 5010. That's terrible, but stuff like this happens. So if you have any questions, you can drop a comment uh, below or you can send me an email to edi.dallas.zoho.com or by all means, stop by our domain, remorebay.com, and leave a message, uh, share some information, uh, let me know what you think. Thanks for watching my video, and I hope this has helped out.